Good secrets cannot be revealed easily. But that is exactly what intrigues Harold Schumann. He's a journalist for a major daily newspaper in Berlin. Editor for Special Projects is harmlessly stated on his office door, but behind that title lurk exciting and provocative questions. What are they? Harold Schumann's subject is money, finance, balance sheets, millions, billions, trillions. And this is his latest story. In the Eurozone, one country after the other needs to borrow money from the other Euro countries in order to save the banks. But who actually gets this money? Where does it flow? Most people think that we, the Germans or the other wealthy Europeans, would save the poor people in Spain or Greece or Ireland or Portugal. But that's not true. We rescue the banks, but what do the banks do with the money that they get? Where does it go? Where has all this money gone? Well, that's a very good question. Don't we have at least the right to know for whom we do it? Who are the beneficiaries of all this? Yeah, but I, I don't think that's the point with respect. I don't think that is the point. And as I, and I don't think you can ignore this point. If the policy is foisted on mm -hmm. the public, and I, effectively we were in a, not in a position to be able to fund ourselves, and that was the majority yeah. view of the ECB, uh, who they are or who they're not, who they're not, is not really relevant to the substantial point that the Irish public had to pick up the bill. Why shall taxpayers take billions and billions of additional credit risk only in order to save creditors, and then they get not even the right to learn who are the beneficiaries? Well, the beneficiary, you know, is the whole economy. The beneficiary is the, the situation of confidence. Well, but the beneficiaries are also those, all those creditors who made bad investments. Well, for sure, and they will have to, to take, uh, you know, some pinch. Well, in Ireland, all senior creditors have been bailed out. Well, you know, I think they lost Ireland, not a single cent. In Ireland, in Ireland, they made a lot of mistakes. Why not publish a list of the creditors, so there can be an informed debate about it? I think you have a somewhat naive idea of what the balance sheet of a bank looks like. I think not. I have dealt with them intensely, believe me. They're very intertwined. And if one bank is not solvent anymore, then it will immediately trigger doubts about the solvency of the next bank, because it may have credit at the other. And so one bank infects the next. I would have no problem if this process were to become more transparent. But the situation to date, for example in Germany, the country I know best, is that regulators are virtually powerless to push for it. Often what happens is that supervisory authorities make certain information available to Parliament and then, in unexplained ways, it finds its way into a newspaper. But the regulators and even the government have no way to forge transparency directly because the practices fall under a company's protected commercial or industrial privacy. Now the moment you receive aid, all of that has to change. Nevertheless, if you want to get information today, you're in for a surprise. Experts from the financial world who have agreed to talk often find themselves slapped with gag orders and they suddenly cancel appointments, mostly with flimsy excuses. Even financial institutions like the heavily damaged Bankia, which will receive tens of billions of euros from the state, is not willing to provide information. So what do we do now? No. So they're in the assembly until five o'clock, but we can call them after that. I will give it another try then at five. But it's really outrageous, this general attitude that somehow if we stick our heads in the sand all these stupid questions will go away. That's absurd. The questions will multiply. How can democracy work without public information? Right here in this building 24 billion euros of tax money is being flushed away. And it will probably require 25 billion more if our interview partners are right. And they still don't reveal any information. This is crazy. 
In the ongoing financial crisis since 2008, there have been only two exceptions to this kind of bank bailout confidentiality. The first happened in the United States Senate. After the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers, the global insurer AIG had to be rescued from collapse. And then a senator told the representative of the Federal Reserve, you needn't come back here ever again to ask for a single penny if you do not tell us who the recipients of this money are. Lo and behold, it was other major financial institutions and banks from around the world. Above all, Deutsche Bank, which received 11.6 billion and Goldman Sachs with over 10 billion and so on. All the big players. And interestingly, exactly those who had always claimed afterwards that they had made it without government money. Deutsche Bank would have been immediately bankrupt if it had not been for the AIG bailout. More than half of their equity would have been lost. They would have had to be closed the next day. You see, for the Deutsche Bank, it was all or nothing. The second exception from the confidentiality was related to the rescue of the German Hypo real estate. Someone at the Chancellery wanted to know what would actually happen if we do not save the HRE? Who would the claimants be? And the list I've compiled with the help of several people from different sources showed, yes, the main beneficiaries were Unicredit, Deutsche Post, DZ Bank, Deutsche Bank, Deutsche Apotheker and Ärzte Bank and so on. A lot of insurance companies, one could have asked to bear some losses. Because after all, they had invested their money in a mismanaged bank, and as such, they had made a mistake. With the launch of the Euro in 2000, in the smaller countries, interests fell dramatically because they suddenly belonged to a large currency area. This let the banks and the governments borrow a lot of money for all kinds of projects much more than the amount of savings in those countries. Banks in Germany, France and other Eurozone states were only too willing to give almost unlimited credit. In the three years up to the beginning of 2008, Spanish borrowers accumulated 322 billion euros of new debt from German and French banks alone. Most of it was invested in real estate, because investors were convinced that prices would rise forever. The result was that much more was built than was needed. In the end, thousands of borrowers were not able to pay back their loans. This is why Spanish and Irish banks were about to go bankrupt and could no longer make good on their loans. Creditors in Germany, France and elsewhere had not planned for such a scenario. I was president of a Spanish savings bank in 2001 and 2002 and was in Germany in order to obtain money. The German banks were swimming in cash, so they gave it easily, without requiring major explanations for what this money is used. Was it difficult to obtain the money? It was easy, very easy. But we didn't have him at gunpoint and force him to take the money. No, not like that. He came here to woo, you see, and I'm sometimes quite annoyed by these discussions. Everyone makes mistakes. We've also made mistakes in Germany. We also have to deal with our problems. But I don't like it when you hear all around that others are to blame. Everyone should solve their own problems. As they say, if everyone swept in front of their own door, the whole neighborhood would be clean. How many apartments were planned here? Apartments were planned here for 1,300 residents, but it doesn't say how many apartments exactly. Walking along here, you can see that this is obviously worthless. Probably no one will ever live here. Who wants to spend a holiday next to the train tracks? You could probably take a tour of Spain to see where the billions have been sunk. Oh no, look, over there. It goes on even further. Yeah. 
What they all hope for is that, for some miraculous reason, the machine will start up again. And these toxic assets, as they are called, these investments that were made with loans that are now all owned by the banks, that they will rise again in value. And what they don't understand is that the indebtedness is so high that the demand cannot rise again as long as most businesses and private households in the countries have to save, which means spending less than you earn. This is what saving is. It's naive to think that one must simply establish enough confidence again and then everything starts over. But it cannot start over again until all the debt is erased. That means, sooner or later, at least a part of the debt must be cancelled. What is happening in the Euro bailout is that an increasing proportion of the credit risk is being transferred from private investors to the state. That is the core of the whole Euro bailout until the day comes where the states themselves cannot repair their debts to the richer countries. And then what happens is exactly what Mrs. Merkel promised would never happen, namely that German tax money is used to cover the risks that private investors have taken in other countries. And yet these private investors came mainly from Germany. This fact is often not mentioned. Nowhere else did the property boom go so drastically wrong as in Ireland. Cheap money from Germany, France and the UK heated the biggest real estate boom in the world. Ostentatious buildings all stood empty and therefore all six major Irish banks went bankrupt. Most dramatically the Anglo-Irish Bank. That bank alone left 30 billion euros of additional debt to the small Irish state. And in the end, that bank had to be closed. The only thing left are the ruins of a planned new headquarters. That is no longer needed now. The Irish state so far has spent more than 70 billion euros to save six failed banks mm -hmm. or financial institutions. Where has all the money gone? Well, it's a very good question. Uh, in a lot of cases, the money has gone to repay creditors to those banks, uh, people who lent money to those banks the so-called bondholders. Well, who are those creditors? Who are those speculators? Well, this is part of the problem. We, have, we don't know. These payments are made through a clearinghouse system which guarantees creditor anonymity. Uh, so we simply don't know for sure. But isn't it outrageous that there's Irish money being spent for foreign investors who made a bad investment and nobody knows who it is? I think outrageous is putting it mildly. It uh, makes a joke of democracy, it, doesn't it? It makes an absolute joke, but I think it's, it's, it goes to the nub of the, of the Eurozone crisis, which is that people uh, right across the Eurozone don't really understand what's happening. Most German people or French people don't realise is that they are the people who are ultimately being bailed out. Money is being channelled through Ireland in order to facilitate that making good of reckless speculators who lent money to Irish banks that had a, a very unrestrained splurge in the property market, uh, and taxpayers are now paying the bill for that. What are the consequences for the Irish people of this 70 billion expense? People's living standards, on average, are down 25%. You're head of the community here. Well, community chairperson of the local community association, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And what has changed since the crisis broke out in, in autumn 2008? Well, what it meant for our community really was uh, cutbacks. And do you notice the change here in your shop? You will notice the change in the area, yeah, yeah. No question about it, you know. And it's going to get worse. I mean, they're talking about a huge uh, cutback now in the budget coming up in December. And then uh, the same for the next three, maybe four years. I mean, that's, that's unsustainable. That can't, that can't happen, you know. Mm -hmm. And yes, but that never changes, that's going to be constant, you know. But do you think how many households have at least one unemployed? Probably 80%. 18. 80. 18. 80. This government has to spend every year only for the Anglo-Irish heritage 3.2 billion. Well, the bondholders is one thing, you know. Uh, that was uh, the decision that was taken, I think, in 2008, in September. The 
The Irish had deliberately low taxes and minimal supervision. They supervise their banks less stringently than the Germans. That's why banks everywhere, including German banks, when they wanted to make money, went to Ireland. There were lower taxes and globalization makes this possible. The supervision was not very strict and the Irish attracted all of this with lower taxes and less supervision. At first this was very profitable for the Irish economy, but when the banking system collapses in a country, then either the state is insolvent and then it has huge problems, its citizens will sink into poverty, or it must very arduously save the money from somewhere else. For Ireland that was very difficult, very hard. If the Irish sum were transferred proportionally to the German economy, it would be 1 trillion euros. Incredible. But the cause in Ireland is something Ireland itself created. Not Luxembourg, not France, not Germany, but Ireland. And it benefited from it for some time. Then everyone has to bear the consequences of a wrong-headed policy. They also previously benefited from it. The Irish know this. Most of all, the Irish know that they were forced to pay off all foreign creditors of their bankrupt banks and exempt them from any responsibility. And the European Central Bank played a fateful role in this. This is proved by this report that was done for the European Parliament and which was written by the internationally renowned professor of monetary policy, Carl Whelan. So I was asked by the European Parliament to discuss the ECB's role that they had played in in the various adjustment programs, but obviously in my case I chose to focus on Ireland. Um, and you wrote, I quote, the ECB's involvement in Ireland, in particular its policy in relation to senior bank debt, has raised serious questions about whether it has overstretched to act beyond its mandate. What was the reaction of the ECB on this? I don't know, but... You I, don't know. You have I, never I, got one. I, I've never got one. I, I suspect I'm not on their Christmas card list. So the ECB at the time uh, wanted to see all the bondholders paid back. And they got their way. And why they wanted it? Well, well a short answer to that is you, you should ask them. I believe that the ECB... I do believe that the ECB has acted within its mandate. That is primarily to ensure price stability and to contribute to the stabilization of the financial markets. There's a hierarchy of objectives enshrined in the mandate. I think they found themselves in a situation that was in fact relatively new, but also clearly saw the danger of contagion. And it was at that time the primary objective to prevent the contagion. In one of your articles you wrote, Ireland paid the creditors at virtually gunpoint. Mm. Uh, who hold the gun? The gun was held by the European Central Bank. Yes. The suspicion is that the European Central Bank said, you will continue to pay these bondholders to whom you owe nothing, or we will pull the emergency funding out of your banking system, thereby collapsing your banking system, thereby collapsing your economy. Mm. To me, that is, that is gunboat diplomacy. Or blackmailing, simply. <laughs> or blackmail. It's a very, very serious threat yeah. for a central bank to have made in actually forcing a sovereign nation to surrender its sovereignty to bail out an independent group of investors was the ECB acting illegally. Of course, that was a position that was foisted on the Irish people as a result of the decisions taken by... Foisted? Yes, well, in that, in that uh, obviously on the senior bondholder mm -hmm. side, it was the uh, majority view of the ECB uh, that this money had to be paid back. That's an outrageous incident. A renowned economist, a member of the Irish Parliament with an education in economics at Harvard, and the Irish finance minister say their people have been forced to take on 70 billion euros of additional debt to pay off foreign creditors. And the director of the European Central Bank does not even object, does not deny this. Unfortunately, most Irish people have become sadly resigned, but not all of them. No other crisis country so far has managed to carry his protest against the wrong policies of the ECB to Frankfurt. Just the Irish. The crazy thing is, the protesters do not come from the capital or from any large industrial company but from the far-flung Irish province, a small Irish village whose inhabitants 
have decided to demonstrate public opposition. And they do it every week. The wind. The wind, the wind, the wind. For us, it looks a bit like the story of Asterix and the small village resisting the Roman Empire, you know? We are the Asterix of Ireland. <laughs> you know, but the thing is, you know, I mean, a lot of people have said to me, you know, here even in the parish, and they're saying to me, you know, you're, kind of, you're mad. Like, there's no way you can take on the, the ECB. And I'm saying, well, you know, I know it's kind of a big dream, but I said, if you're going to dream, you might as well dream big. There's no point in dreaming small, you know? And like what they're doing, it's not just in Ireland, it's what they're doing Europe-wide. You know, they're getting away with this Europe-wide. Like, they're, they're using this word, and words are very important, socializing the debt. And like, I think there's nothing more anti-social than what they're doing. Justice. Justice for Ireland. You've been to Frankfurt too? Yes, yes. Yes. And did you talk to Germans there? We did, and they, they were very nice to us. Uh, they even brought us food. They, we had a German um, tax. We had it in German and what was happening here in Ireland. But did they understand your case? Oh, I'm sure they did. Because, you know, most of the Germans think we have saved them. Yeah? Most of the Germans are told that they are saving the others in, in an act of European solidarity and um, that, that, that we have rescued Ireland. Huh? No, Ireland has rescued Europe. Get that into their heads. They, when the night of the, the, of the guarantee, the, Ireland guaranteed and it saved it, to stop the contagion going. And to, yeah, it was Ireland. Ireland saved Europe. And, and, and now we should be rewarded. You see, Ireland looks very well abroad now because it's cutting, cutting, cutting. But the people are suffering. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. The people, the, the people are suffering terribly. Please help us, like, put something in our bowl. <laughs> OK. To start with such a small group and to try to kick off a movement shows a lot of conviction and courage. And you can see that, yes, people have understood. It's not we, the Germans, who have saved them. Rather, Little Ireland has saved the banking system in Europe and they now have more debt than they can live with. And if Ireland cannot pay at the end, then it is also up to the German taxpayers. It happened in that order. And people here understand it. And this is why they are so angry, that it is reported so completely differently, especially among the European public. Where does the money go now? When Ireland's banks got 64 billion euros, what did they do with it? The crazy thing is, there is no specific, precise information available for the general public. But there are strong indications. The Bank of International Settlements, the central bank for the central banks, collects all kinds of data from 24 member countries. Through their statistics department and through their website you can get data on cross-border claims between different countries and also to the banks. Here you see, for example, that in autumn 2010, when the waves were crashing over Ireland about who should be paid and who should not, German banks still had an outstanding claim on Irish banks of 28 billion. That would have been really a lot of money. If you want to know who the creditors actually are, and who could possibly know this, there was at least one person who had the urge to inform the public. This is the website of the blogger who writes under the pseudonym Guido Fox. An insider sent him a list that includes a total of 80 addresses, including 50 alone from Germany and France. For example, the Deutsche Bank Asset Management, the Raiffeisen Kapitalgesellschaft, or the Union Investment Private Fund. France's largest bank is also included, or the Rothschild Company. It's like a kind of who is who of the financial world.
You published a list of creditors of the Anglo-Irish. Uh, what was the background to this? I think it's a crime to have these lists. You, you know, by law, it's not supposed to be available. But you have not been an investigator? No, I, I have uh, um, public interest defence. What do you have seen from the list? I saw massive holdings of Irish bonds by European banks, and primarily German, French and British. It was a mixture of smart investors and what we call dumb money when I used to be a bond trader. Uh, the uh, Spasa banks, the regional landers banks, and all the bond funds that you'd expect to see in there were in there. In Irish circles, there was a lot of anger. They could see big investment banks and wondered why we're paying risk-taking bond traders yeah. who are paid to take the risk, and we're going to close down hospitals to pay for it. Could the government have done an own investigation to get this data? The Irish government is a sovereign government. They yeah. can. They could, the Treasury could have ordered it made public who they were paying, and they should have. The Germans are told that we have saved the Irish. When the money was sent from the uh, German Finance Ministry and the British Finance Ministry, by the way, they sent a large chunk as well, it went straight into the Irish Treasury and back out before the close of business. Yeah. And it went back to German banks who would have gone bankrupt without that. But you do expect that Ireland sooner or later will default on this? I hope so. We can't afford to pay it back. Mm -hmm. Ireland has this burden which every month, for every man, woman and child in Ireland, they export 300 euros. That's a phenomenal burden. My children will be educated in Ireland. I don't want them to have to pay taxes to the German banks forever. So does it mean that Ireland will sooner or later default? Yeah. No country on earth in history has ever paid that amount of money back without having their own monetary policy. But how will this evolve in practice? you gradually bleed year on year on year and on year. And now you really do depend on Europe. There was a quote by Nelson Mandela where he said something like, it is the greatest tragedy of the human condition that we must endure so much pain before arriving at a compromise that we always knew was going to be needed. So I am focusing all of my efforts on trying to avoid Ireland slowly bleeding for 10 years or 15 years until we've gone back 30 years in terms of development and then somebody finally says, let's cut the debt. But even the Deputy Finance Minister of Ireland, with whom we have spoken, said recently that the debt is now so large it actually exceeds Ireland's economic power. Shouldn't we take the warning seriously and now forgive a part of the debt so Ireland can restart? Look, Ireland has an aid program, and Ireland is a prime example that our European policy to stabilize the euro works, and Ireland is now again beginning to earn the confidence of the financial markets. I don't know much about that Deputy Finance Minister and what he meant, but I suppose he said the right thing and he meant the right thing. But I can only say, from my point of view, that Ireland is on the right track, has achieved great success and earned trust, but it should not destroy that trust. Well, he holds a very tough position. It is the Irish and the Spaniards' own fault, and if we make the creditors pay, the system collapses, so we cannot include the creditors, and everyone should sweep in front of their own house, as he says, and should stop the finger-pointing. But it is ultimately an accusation, because he actually blames the indebted countries and does not see any responsibility on the part of the German investors. The European Central Bank could easily compensate the wrong it did to the Irish in order to protect Europe's banks. Because in the course of the crisis, the Anglo-Irish Bank borrowed 30 billion euros from the ECB to pay their creditors. And the ECB, however, like all the other central banks of the world, was not allowed to give this money without receiving collateral, which the Anglo-Irish did not have. So at that time, the Irish government had to step in and take responsibility. And now, after Anglo-Irish was liquidated, the ECB demands that the Irish government repay the 30 billion euros. But there are a lot of economists and politicians in Ireland who demand that the ECB should simply cancel that debt. If we make ECB take a haircut, or if ECB consents to actually literally writing off part 
of its fund into the Irish banks mm -hmm. right now. In terms of the economics, it makes sense because the ECB, the rest of the Eurozone, will only benefit from Ireland's membership in the Eurozone. But then the Germans, will, but then the Germans will say, uh, what will happen to the balance sheet of the ECB? Who will, who will pay for the losses of the ECB? But no one has to pay for the losses of the ECB because the money has been already emitted. The money is already in the system and what's even better, the money in the system already operating and proving that there is no inflation. We are not printing new money, we are not creating new money. So you tell us that there may be a debt forgiveness without anybody having a loss? Yes, that's the monetary system. If we comply with this demand, then that is to the advantage of the Irish government. That would be monetary state financing, and that is criticized heavily in Germany. Or we're accused of undertaking the same practices elsewhere, which is not true. But it wouldn't really hurt anyone if the ECB cancelled this particular debt, which arose under very special conditions. There would be no harm, would there? Perhaps the ECB's profits would be reduced. I think the damage would be that if you cannot settle this one debt, then a chain reaction would be triggered in the entire Irish financial system. You are 100% sure that the ECB could cancel this debt without any consequence? Oh, sure. Tomorrow. The, there is one consequence, and the consequence is what you said. The consequence is everyone else then wants that. I mean, in fairness to any central bank, you do not lightly print money and give it to people. That's a very, very dangerous precedence to set. This is an exceptional case. This is a well-functioning, hard-working, productive economy that has bailed out a banking system and is now driving. But a very a similar situation is now developing in, in Spain. Well, then they're going to make the same mistake that Ireland made, and they shouldn't do it. They shouldn't do it. What the Spanish could learn from the Irish lesson? I think uh, the Spanish, the first thing they need to learn uh, is that um, putting all of the bank debt on the, on the sovereign is a dreadful mistake. Okay. okay, thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Very nice to meet you. And welcome to Rathfarnham. Thank you very much. Okay. Enjoy your time. Thank nice you. to meet you, Harry. Thanks very thanks much. All the best. Bye-bye now. Three months ago, the Irish government took over the presidency of the European Union and has since been using the opportunity to lighten the burden of their own inherited bank debts. In fact, they have now done a deal with the European Central Bank and claim that this has brought great relief. But I'm a bit skeptical about whether it's true or not. Hi, Stephen. The Irish government made a deal with the ECB. Has this been a good deal, what you have asked for? I think there is a, a good side and a bad side to what's happened. So by having a lower interest payment for probably somewhere between five and 10 years, the net present value of the deal is probably four to six billion euros. So that's, that's definitely welcome. It doesn't cost the ECB anything because they're still lending at the same rate. The flip side is, well, yes, it is good, but let's never forget that we never owed this money in the first place. Okay, thank you. Are we done? Thank you very much. Pleasure to see you, Harold. So indirectly, the ECB is admitting that they didn't give the Irish a fair deal. Otherwise, they wouldn't have authorized the extension of payment time on their debts. Meanwhile, in Spain, it's the same dramatic story and it will probably get worse. <laughs> And is he aware of the direction of our question, of what the, the involvement of the German and French banks was in the Spanish boom? Yeah, yeah, exactly. In the late afternoon we'll also meet Rayo, the economics expert. Before we came to Spain, we were in Ireland. May I just show you what an economist from the Irish Parliament said as advice for Spain? But a similar situation is developing in, in Spain. 
with one very important difference. The Spanish people will not have capitalized their banks. That's what they are going to do now. Well, then they're going to make the same mistake that Ireland made, and they shouldn't do it. They shouldn't do it. Let them fail. Let the banks fail. You know, not all of them, but banks have to be allowed to fail. There's nothing wrong with a bank failing. What do you think of this? Well, I think that uh, the Irish situation is totally different than the Spanish situation. Uh, as I have said before, uh, the size of the balance sheet of the Irish banks in, uh, in comparative terms vis-a-vis -vis the GDP of Ireland was, you know, three times larger than the case of Spain. So I think that, uh, well, in the case of Ireland, uh, the cost of recapitalizing the banks has been above 20% of the Irish GDP. Mm -hmm. In the case of Spain, we are talking about 4% of GDP. So it's a total, totally different situation, and it's not comparable at all. How much the Spanish state has spent so far for the bank rescues? Well, so far, so far, taking into consideration, so far, 20 billion. 20 billion. 20 billion in capital injections. And besides that, we will inject the 40 billion, that is the loan that we are going to receive from the EFSF. And you are really sure that this will be enough? For sure. The real figure is not 40 billion, but 80 or 90 billion. So that's the true figure that one can uh, take from Oliver Wyman's report. But why it is not even considered to make also the senior, the senior creditors to share the burden with a bail-in? Well, I don't know why, because that would be the sensible solution to our banking system, the only sensible solution I would add. So, they want to pay everything, but of course with taxpayers, with Spanish taxpayers' money. So that's a crazy thing. Here in Spain, the biggest problem is Bankia. It is said that this bank alone will need 24 billion yeah. additional capital, which is additional to, I don't know how much already the state yeah, has injected. Uh, uh, around fi uh, 5 billion. 5 billion. Yes. So in the end, it will be around 30 billion. Yeah. Um, according to its balance sheet, Bankia has also 27 billion euros senior yeah. unsecured debt. Who are the holders of that debt? Well, we don't really know because authorities have been very, uh, well, very secretive. Uh, they don't want to, to tell us who are the holders of that debt. I don't know why. Who exactly is it from whom I, as the taxpayer, take the risk? We should have the names the list of names of the creditors of Bankia, for I example. That, I think that's not going to be, you know, a, a vital piece of information, if you allow me uh, to say. At least the Spanish taxpayers should have the right. Who are those creditors who are bailed out? We know who are those creditors. Well, but the public doesn't know. Yes, they know more or less, because they know the exposure. They do not know the concrete names, but, uh, you know, there is a public information about the breakdown by country of this kind of senior debt holders. The problem of Spain is that the great majority of this debt has been granted by foreign investors. Hello, you reached the voicemail of Dennis Peters. I'm not able to come... Hassan Rufbeantworte. Hallo Frau Mirjan, Schumann nochmal. Where does all this money go? Okay. Um, it, it's again it's difficult for us to comment on the record about the, the instance of, of Bankia. No, of course not. Thank you very much. Have a good uh, afternoon. Excuse me, but that is a classic delay tactic. I cannot interpret it any other way. Look, here is some information about the Spanish bank bonds. Here is one of many outstanding bonds from Bankia where you can see some of those involved. That's the information we are looking for. But I can't say where I got it from.
There are sometimes friendly people that help me. That's the only way I can get into this information system. The man we are about to meet is the one who filed a lawsuit for the closure of Bankia and its rescue? Exactly. He wanted the bank to go broke and not have funds come from the state to save it. He did it for these 15 M people who began to occupy the square in May of last year. I have a list here. These are all outstanding debt securities from Bankia. All the companies published here are ones that could actually bear the losses. Deutsche Bank AG, DWS Investment, Allianz Global Investors, Union Investment, Deutsche Bank again, DWS Investment, Union Investment, Deutsche Bank, Otra vez. They should. <laughs> but if you speak with representatives of the government parties or with speakers of the banks, they say, but that would destroy the trust and the whole system would collapse. Which side is right? We do, not them. If you were to drop Bankia, it would probably lead to the collapse of other banks. But not the big banks like BBVA, Santander, La Caixa, Sabadell or Popular. When I was at university, I was told this is what market economy is about. If you do invest, you have the right to all the profit, but you also have responsibility for this investment. And if it goes wrong, you have to take the losses. That's the principle of market economy. And in this case, there have been made a lot of bad investments especially from foreigners, and nobody talks about their co-responsibility for what happened. I fully agree. I fully agree. I fully and agree. they don't have to take a cent of loss. But there is another principle of a market economy that I think that is extremely important and that is also studied in the first course of economics in any university, is that uh, a money market economy with fiat money is unstable. And we have an example that we let the banks go down. You know when? Oh, yes, I do remember quite well. It was Lehman Brothers. No, it was the Great Depression. Hmm? It was the worst depression that we had over the last century. It's all scaremongering. I don't want that. I want numbers. I want to know what would really happen if they were to go bankrupt. What would we do with this data? What would be the outcome? With what we know now, we'd say, this bank is beyond saving. We can't continue to pour billions of euros into it. The creditors must take losses. If the one bank is no longer solvent, that will immediately prompt doubts whether the next bank is still solvent, because it may have credit at the other bank, and so one bank infects the other one. And that's why this financial system must be safeguarded from the collapse of an institution that could entail the collapse of the whole sector. For the ordinary citizen, it's often difficult to understand how the decision is taken, which bank is systemically relevant and which one is not. Uh, well, for for a, example, a, why, why Bankia is rele systemically is not, relevant? Well, Bankia is very easy to say what is relevant. It's the third bank in Spain. The fourth. The third. The third? Yeah. Uh, according it to, was. To, to balance volume. It, uh, was, balance a third. Volume. it was a third. Now, mm. maybe, mm -hmm. it's the fourth, but it was a third. Mm -hmm. And what would happen if we would let them fail? No, we, we cannot afford. Why there is not done a bail-in instead no, of you a bail-out? You are anticipating what is being negotiated right now. And together with the Spanish authorities, the European Commission and the European Central Bank, we are negotiating this restructuring plan, so you cannot anticipate. The Let's plan. assume for a moment my figure is correct, mm -hmm. just for a moment. Mm -hmm. I will not negotiate with you. <laughs> I am negotiating with the Spanish authorities. Now we know. 
The trial uncovered that the bank figures were falsified by upper management. But now we discover that the same had happened at the lower management levels. So a banking culture developed where employees were rewarded with bonuses so that the upper level did not realize how bad things were at the local branch level. But that's criminal. The judge said that there was indeed public control of the bank. But the government supervisors played along. Letting the fox guard the hens is good for nothing. They're all criminals, those in charge of Bankia and the public supervisors. If they'd let the savings banks go bankrupt, we would have found out what the politicians did with the money. Much of the debt that cannot be repaid is money that went to political parties, to city administrations, for work in the autonomous southern regions, to companies connected to the government. These revelations would have made the political class disappear. But this means that if the other euro countries lend Spain 100 billion euros to rescue their banking system, they are making a huge mistake because they are basically pumping money into a totally corrupt system which they will never get back. And in the end, the taxpayer in Germany, France, Holland, Finland and so on have to finance the losses, right? Exactly. That's how it will end. What is his advice to the German citizens? What should they do? What should they demand? Numbers, the balance sheets. It's simple. You have to know the facts and apply the laws. Anybody who follows the question to the very end comes to the same conclusion. When they say that this all has to be done in order to save the system, then they should put up all the evidence on the table. But this is exactly what is not happening. On the one hand, they say the whole system will collapse, doomsday is coming if we do not act. On the other hand, if you ask them what will actually happen if we let the banks go bankrupt, who would be hurt, where would the money be missing, which other banks would collapse, then you don't get any answers. And they say this is private business information. But if it is private business related, Related, then why are they involved and how and why do they know this information? And exactly this question, who is it that gets the money in the end and why do the banks have to be saved? This question has never been answered anywhere in the world. Cyprus is the tax evasion center in Europe. The two largest banks, the Leiki Bank and the Bank of Cyprus, accrued more than 60 billion euros alone. But the Greek crisis led to losses for the Cypriot banks in the region of two-digit billions and the Leiki Bank was actually already insolvent in 2012. The government buoyed up the bank with tax money until, in March 2013, the Cypriot state itself was insolvent and desperately needed emergency funds from the ESM. However, this time, Europe's financial ministers decided that it should be the depositors who pay and not the taxpayers. Clients of both banks, who had deposits of more than 100,000 euros, lost in total more than 6 billion euros overnight. By saying those who have caused the problem should take responsibility, Chancellor Merkel meant in the first instance Russian investors. But this policy also impacts the wrong people. Hundreds of Cypriot businesses lost their working capital and are now unable to pay their suppliers and workers. The economy in Cyprus is at a standstill. How much you have lost? More than 3 million euros. Which were simply hold as a safety cushion for bad days. This is lifetime efforts and savings. And these savings disappeared in just one night. Mm -hmm. We were punished. We feel betrayed because we trusted the banking system in Cyprus, and we trusted European Union. Who took the decision not to give exemptions for working capital? It is a Eurogroup decision. Uh, for us, it was a take it or leave it uh, situation, uh, a decision that we accepted under uh, pressure and with no time to negotiate extensively. Essentially, both our kneecaps 
have been broken, mm -hmm. and now we are asked to run. Up until now, I've always asked who gets the money from the bailout. Now, here in Cyprus, the question is, who pays? Actually, that's a, that's a very good question. It's a, a, a change from past bailouts that we have had to bail in on this occasion uninsured depositors in the two uh, big Cypriot banks uh, like Ian Bank of Cyprus. The burden of this bail-in has been borne partly by non-residents but also partly by, by residents, um, Cypriot companies and, and uh, uh, households. About two-thirds of the burden has been borne actually by non-residents and one-third by residents. Why it has not been possible to make a difference between the holders of interest-bearing accounts with high interest rates and the, the current accounts of companies who simply had their working capital stored with the bank. Unfortunately, the political decision that made by Eurogroup uh, was one in which there wasn't enough funds to do that. For a long time, uh, the major bank was financed by the ACB through emergency liquidity assistance. So by the time the bail-in issue came in, there was something like 9 point billion of financing from ECB from the Eurozone. So that was taxpayers' money coming in. Which has replaced money withdrawn from depositors? During this period of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So there was already bailout through the Eurozone system. The European Central Bank allowed the Cypriot Central Bank to give money to banks in Cyprus even though they were insolvent. That's a real mistake because then non-functioning structures are upheld and taxpayers' money, and that's what we're talking about with the central bank, is endangered. In this way, the ECB slowed down the rescue program and made it possible for many creditors to withdraw their money and invest it elsewhere. Shouldn't the ECB itself have been liable for the risky credits they gave to an insolvent bank? The ECB was a creditor acting in self-interest to protect its own money. This conflict of interest should never have been allowed to happen, but it did because central bank money was put into bad banks. During January 2012 and December 2012, financial institutions from inside the Eurozone withdraw more than 10 billion euros from the Cypriot banking system. May it be said that the delayed insolvency of the Leiki Bank and the Berlin offered other European banks the possibility to withdraw their money from Cyprus? Certainly the delays uh, offered more informed investors to protect their own investments. Mm -hmm. And they, they put the less informed investors at a disadvantage. There are people who say the ECB allowed to prolong this ELA loans to Leiki in order to give other European banks a chance to withdraw their money over the year? Um, I mean, I couldn't possibly comment on that. I mean, this is just uh, this is obviously some sort of rumor. All I can say is that the ECB has provided uh, ELA to like in accordance to Eurosystem rules. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is no question that the Central Bank of Cyprus knew, and we have statements from the Central Bank that say they knew, that the bank is insolvent. Therefore, they had no reason or no right to continue to increase the cost of a bailout. Then the other question is, where was the European Central Bank? Because Frankfurt was sleeping at the helm. Yes. Frankfurt extended this liquidity to a bank that was insolvent. This is against the rules. And this is also against any logic. You know that you're essentially extending a loan to someone who cannot possibly pay back. What the ECB did was also very problematic from a legal point of view. We have to find out who bears responsibility for this. Who should look into it? The problem is that the ECB is a closed shop and neither the European Parliament nor national parliaments are really able to call it to account when it breaks the rules. But who had the best information of all is the central bank and the ECB. So. 
shouldn't they stay in line before the depositors take their losses? That's certainly a point of view that you may, um, you may want to have, but I couldn't, I couldn't agree with that because obviously protecting the central banks, one protects the financial stability and the core of the banking system. To me, it looks a bit like also as a cover-up of the mistakes done by the ECB Council. I, I don't see any mistakes done by the ECB Council. The case of Cyprus shows once again how important it is to make public what happens to the bankrupt banks and where money flows from and to whom. Yet again, something has been covered up, hidden interests have been protected. And the problem in all this is, as long as people don't find out what's really happening and whose interests are being protected, that nourishes conspiracy theories and incites one European country against the other. I personally think that actually this game with national stereotypes is one of the greatest dangers of this crisis, and we have at least a perceived north-south division in the EU, which I think is a real risk. You have to say in Germany over and over again, and we do this constantly, when our neighbours are not doing well, Germany will also not do well. And you begin to see in terms of climate change, in terms of human rights, in terms of aid to Africa, in terms of a liberal, progressive humane agenda around the world. Europe is the leading light in the world for this. And it's an incredible institution, and we should be proud of it, and we should be trying to strengthen it. And this is weakening it. Everything we do that um, pits different groups of people against each other is weakening Europe. And we've got to fight for it. We have got to stand up for it. And that means that the people in all countries need to know the truth, and they don't know the truth because they're not being fed the truth by the politicians. What is the truth? The truth is all of us have the interest in solving these questions. If you are right, don't you think the, the Commission needs to explain much more to, to the European citizens that we are sitting in one boat? We explain this principle every day. What we don't want is to be the only ones explaining this. Yeah, because... What we don't want is to be here in Brussels or in uh, Berlin or in Madrid explaining this and all the other voices coming from the national uh, quarters mm -hmm. say, no, no, my interest is the only one that is important. The interests of the others are not relevant. It's even worse. The German, the ruling but politicians we, we in Germany, they even hide their own we cannot economic be, interest. We cannot be alone telling the truth. OK. This is the headline. <laughs> <laughs>